only mode. Okay, Emily, we are ready to begin. Go ahead. Okay, thank you. Good, good morning or good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to the Border 2020 webinar st sponsored by the Sustainable Materials Waste Management and Clean Sites Goal 3 uh, Border Team. We are pleased you are participating with us today. My name is Emily Pimentel, and I'm an environmental scientist at the Environmental Protection Agency San Francisco office and I am the co-chair for the Border 2020 Goal 3 Task Forces for the California, Baja California, and Arizona Sonora region. Our webinar today is an introduction to the eStewards uh, certification. Um, before I introduce our speaker today, I would, our speakers today, I would like to introduce uh, Renee uh, from our uh, EPA Region 6. Uh, Renee? Can you say hello hi. so we can hear your voice? Great. Thanks, Emily. Um, hi, my name is Renee Ballou, and I work in the Sustainable Materials Management Program um, with EPA Region 6 in Dallas. And um, we'd like to thank you for joining us on this webinar. This is our second webinar in a series of uh, webinars we're doing on e-waste. Um, and uh, say welcome, and we hope you find these um, webinars informative and, and useful. Thanks, Emily. Thank you, Renee. Thank you. Uh, before we start our webinar, I would like to share a few logistics instructions with you, and then I would like to tell you a little bit about our Border 2020 program and how the electronics uh, management fix, fits into our Goal 3 objective. Uh, Guillermo, can you uh, please uh, give us a few instructions? I just um, before then, but I did want to remind everyone that this webinar is being uh, recorded and being hosted by the Border Environment Cooperation Commission. Uh, they are actually supporting us technically, and our technical support is being provided by Guillermo Rauda. Um, and I would like him, if you could please uh, give us a few words with regard to logistics. Uh, thank you, Emily. Um, we started a few minutes with the webinar. It, so far, I think we're doing good. If you have any questions regarding to the topic, just go ahead and type it in into the questions window on your webinar control panel, and we'll answer them as we go along with the webinar. Thank you. Uh, so I'd just like to remind everyone that we actually have two concurrent webinars. We have a webinar where our presenters will be speaking in Spanish. And in the back offices, we have a concurrent webinar where we have a translator translating the presentation by our English speakers. So all the individuals who are participating in Spanish will be able to uh, state their questions in, in Spanish, and our translators will translate them into English. Uh, they can also type in their questions or comments into the chat box in Spanish, and our translators will, uh, will share them with us in English so that we can all communicate. Uh, so thank you for that uh, support, uh, Guillermo. Um, let me just then start with giving you uh, a quick overview about the Border 2020 uh, program. Many of you may be familiar with Border 2020, but for those of you who are not, I would just quickly like to summarize that we're currently in the latest program of our border program called Border 2020. Uh, this program evolved from the 1983 La Paz Agreement on the cooperation for protection and improvement of the environment in the border area. And it empowers the federal border governments to take on uh, cooperative initiatives to protect public health and the environment. Border 2020 has six goals. 
uh, with objectives to address air, water, land, emergency preparedness, and environmental compliance and stewardship. It's a bottom-up, regionally oriented program focused on measurable results. Our work today focuses on goal three, the land goal, if you will. In the last Border 2020 program, we included work such as cleaning up 12 million tires border-wide, uh, cleaning up sites such as the Metales y Derivado site, uh, an abandoned lead smelter, and we also uh, put on a number of uh, e-waste collection events where we started getting uh, information with regard to uh, promoting awareness with regard to the problem in, in the border region. Um, border 2020 Goal 3 uh, is formally called Sustainable Materials Waste Management and Clean Sites. What we wanted to do under this program is really start talking about sustainable materials, which is a systems approach to using and reusing materials more productively over their life cycle. It, rep it represents a change in how our society thinks about the use of natural resources and environmental protection. By examining how materials are used throughout their life cycle, a susta sustainable materials approach seeks to use materials in the most productive way with an emphasis on using less, reducing toxic chemicals and environmental impacts through the material life cycle and ensure we have sufficient resources to meet today's needs and those of the future. Under the new border program, stakeholders are proposed to rethink how we address waste. Therefore, goal three was developed to move towards thinking about waste as a material. A material is both a simple and a complex idea. Since we're going to talk about electronics today, let's just say that when we discard an electronic device such as a telephone or a computer or even a refrigerator, which has an electronic device, we define these as electronic discards. These are materials. Plastic, metals, and glass are the materials that are in an electronic component. Our goal is to see if we can reuse or repair them, or if not, then we want to recycle the materials contained in electronics. We, con we consider this part of a life cycle approach. As shown in, in the diagram on your screen, it begins from the time that we mine metals to make an electronic device to transport it, use it, and eventually discard it, reuse it, and hopefully recycle it. Instead of landfilling where there is no benefit, we propose to reuse and recycle given there are significant environmental benefits. Safe recycling is an essential step to achieving these results. I would like to uh, proceed now that we have this background uh, with introducing our speakers today. Our speaker um, is Sarah Westerfield, and she is the Director of uh, Policy at East Stewart's, and she will be accompanied um, as well by Mandy Knudsen, who is the Business Manager at East Stewart's. With that, I'd like to begin our webinar on the introduction to the East Stewart's certification. Guillermo, if we could now uh, proceed with uh, giving the uh, panel control to Sarah. Yes, give me a minute and I'll also change the slides on the Spanish one. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, sir, we can see your slides, and we also have a slide shared in the Spanish site, uh, the Spanish webinar, sorry, so we may begin when you, when you decide to do so. Very good. Thanks, Guillermo. Uh, welcome to all of you. We appreciate that you're taking the time today to learn more about the Easter certification program. Our goal is to give you some basic information, but also to open up the microphones and allow you to ask whatever questions you have. Uh, we've set it up so that there are two question periods, uh, sort of in the middle and then again at the end, and we hope that you'll either, again, put your questions in, in the chat box or uh, raise your hand, which you can do over in the control panel, and, and ask your question verbally so we can have more of a dialogue. Um, I am the East Stewart's Policy Director at the Basel Action Network, and I wanted to just give you a little uh, brief 
description of what we're going to be talking about. Um, so the agenda overview. Actually, before I begin, I'd like to interrupt myself and give a, a large thanks to the translators. Uh, I think they have uh, by far the hardest job of all. And we will try to speak slowly and clearly. Uh, and please, to the translators, please interrupt us if you have any needs uh, that we can support. So today, what we're going to talk about is why the Easter Ed Certification Program was created in the first place a couple of years ago. And also give you a little bit of a sense of what makes the Easter Ed Certification Program different than others out there in the marketplace. And then we'll spend a little bit of time looking at the specifics of the standard. Of course, that's a very big question, and we don't have time to go into a lot of detail. And I also wanted to offer you, for those of you who are not familiar with environmental management systems, a little bit of a chance to understand more about what an environmental management system is, uh, if you're new to that. And then again, questions for, for 15 minutes or so. And then I'll turn over the program to Mandy Knudsen, my colleague. She'll introduce herself and uh, give you some information about the market drivers that are actually expanding the Easter Eggs program, and then the real steps of what you can do to move towards certification, so the real kind of step-by-step -step process. And then we've got just a few slides at the end that Mandy will present about uh, the fact that we've got two different versions of the standard available right now and how to figure out uh, which one you ought to uh, move towards if you choose to get Easter certified. Um, just a tiny bit of background on me. I've uh, been with the Basel Action Network for the past 12 years and working on uh, nothing but e-waste for, for that period of time. Uh, we had planned to have Jim Puckett, our executive director, uh, presenting the first few slides. Uh, because of the snowstorm last week, it has completely uh, shifted around his schedule as people were not able to fly in as planned last week. And so I'll be presenting his slides. Um, and then uh, after Mandy, we have Greg Swan's name. Greg will not be able to join us this week because he's now witnessing an audit. Uh, he's our quality control person overseeing all the certification bodies and auditors to ensure that we've got a consistent quality in the whole certification realm. So. Let me move into the real content here about why we, this nonprofit organization, decided to create uh, a certification program. And hmm, I have this persistent window that would like to interfere here, but let's get that out of the way. Um, our program was created by uh, the Basel Action Network, our organization, which is a nonprofit public interest group that is committed to global environmental justice. Our work is based on a United Nations treaty called the Basel Convention, which is a treaty that restricts international trade in hazardous waste. And we as an organization work on the two largest hazardous waste streams that are currently being traded internationally. And those two waste streams are electronic waste, of course, but also obsolete ships, so huge ships uh, that are no longer wanted and they get run up on the beaches in India and Bangladesh and are having profound impacts uh, in those countries. One of the things our organization has done is to document a lot of what's happening or a little bit of what's happening in developed, developing countries um, who are receiving much of these hazardous waste from developed countries. And we've put out films and reports to try to allow others to understand better what the impacts are when developed countries like the United States and Canada and Japan export their hazardous waste uh, to anyone who will receive it. I think all of you on this webinar already know that e-waste is uh, a very high volume, very large volume problem. The UN, I think it was, uh, determined that in 2012 there were 49 million metric tons of e-waste generated. That's a really large number to even imagine. I think it's a little bit easier to understand or imagine um, the following statistic, which is that the Hong Kong government has said that they are receiving about 500 of these shipping containers of e-waste, filled with e-waste, every week. Uh, and that's only Hong Kong. So that, to me, is a little bit more imaginable. So our organization is attempting to 
stop this illegal trafficking uh, in e-waste, especially going from the developed to the developing countries. And we're doing that by offering uh, a market-based solution, this certification program, to help create a responsible recycling industry in the very countries where the hazardous waste is generated, which is one of the things called for in the Basel Convention. And so if, for example, Mexico or the US or Canada is creating its own e-waste, our country should indeed be taking care of it ourselves and not exporting it to some other country to manage it. And this, of course, creates jobs in our own countries, such as Mexico. It also protects the global environment from toxics, and uh, which we know are, are usually ending up in the poorest communities that have the least amount of environmental and occupational protections. So we created this certification program after documenting um, the unfortunate uh, impacts in at least a couple of areas or corners of the world uh, that are having absolutely profound impacts on both human health and the environment. Our very first expose was in Huiyu, China in 2001. In December of 2001, we went to China to this area um, in southeast China where they were uh, breaking open CRTs and also burning this waste stream. Uh, some of you may know that burning electronic waste is the worst thing we can do with this waste stream because it creates additional toxins uh, in the form of halogenated dioxins and furans, which are invisible and tasteless and odorless. So, uh, but that is very commonly done still to this day in order to retrieve uh, some of the metals that are inside the wires or um, heating up circuit boards that uh, uh, have circuits on it. In 2005, so four years later, we had heard that a reaction to our original film called Exporting Harm, we heard a response from many saying, oh, we just need to send our equipment for reuse, and that way we'll be helping to bridge the digital divide. So we put out a film in, called Digital Dump in 2005, documenting what was happening in Lagos, Nigeria. A couple of years later, we went uh, to Ghana, and there documented their burning fields, which were near their open markets where they were selling produce and cattle were grazing. And then we went back to Guiyu, China in 2008 uh, to find that this very primitive management of e-waste was still occurring, but now the materials were carefully bagged up. The government was requiring that they essentially hide the e-waste so that photographers wouldn't be able to identify it as e-waste and they moved the open fires into these long burning houses that they built. Of course, inside there's still open fires, but now there's even more occupational exposure, and of course all of this going up in smoke, including these uh, halogenated furans. Uh, back in 2012, so just a couple of years ago now, we went back to uh, Guangzhou, China. This is e-waste plastics, you probably recognize this, women um, sorting. Many of the plastics recycling facilities in China will, in order to identify what type of plastic, will take a little cigarette lighter and burn a corner of the broken plastic in order to identify what type of plastic it is in order to carefully sort it. That kind of exposure is uh, really profound. Also, uh, in, we went back to China again a third time in 2013, this past June, and uh, many of you may know that the water table there is very high, which means that um, the, the drinking water and, uh, is very easily contaminated. Many of you know, I think, that there are heavy metals in this waste stream which are immortal. They never disappear. Um, so when lead and cadmium and other heavy metals, mercury, uh, end up in the soil and the air and, and the water, uh, they never go away. They, uh, they are elements that persist forever. In this area, we still found that there was a huge amount of heating up circuit boards over a pool of molten lead, the melted lead solder, in order to pull off circuits to send them into the counterfeit circuit market uh, with a tremendous amount of occupational exposure going on. 
And after we did our first film, Exporting Harm, some universities came in to do studies on the health impacts, and they tested children in this region called Guiyu and found that 88% of the children had lead poisoning. I think many of you know that uh, if children are exposed to lead during a window of time during their early life, they end up uh, with permanent brain damage. One of the other issues that we found very powerful in trying to uh, encourage change in behavior from corporations who are generating e-waste, who are creating e-waste, was documenting asset tags. Um, and that proved to be a very powerful uh, motivator. We also were approached by some important uh, media outlets seeking uh, to support our program. And 60 Minutes put on a, a show that they won four or five awards for. Uh, if you haven't seen it, we encourage you to take a look at the 60 Minutes piece. So just a little bit of a story about how we actually uh, uh, started the program. In 2009, 2008, uh, the U.S. convened a process to try to create the very first electronics recycling standard. And uh, BAN, our organization, was part of that development team, very intensely involved for two and a half years. And at the near the end of that time, the rest of the group decided to go ahead and move forward with a field test of the draft standard, knowing that it would violate the Basel Convention, which is the basis for our work. And so at that point, we had to walk away from the process. We did not want to put our name behind a process that would knowingly violate the Basel Convention. And we decided to create our own program and it was also after the R2 standard came out that we received funding from 14 recyclers, one of them was a smelter, um, asking us as the environmental community to please develop a, a higher standard with a very rigorous uh, auditing program. And so I'm just going to share with you a few slides here about what differenti differentiates our program uh, out there globally, really. And one is, as you know, that it is owned by and still run by a nonprofit public interest group that is very committed to environmental justice. This notion that all people uh, deserve clean air, clean water, regardless, and clean jobs, regardless of socioeconomic status or ethnic or race, uh, it, is, it is imperative that everyone has that same access to, to, to clean essential natural services. We also have a very rigorous oversight program. Uh, we mentioned Greg Swan earlier, who is uh, very actively overseeing all the certification bodies to make sure that no matter who you choose, if you decide to get certified, that you can trust that your certification body is doing their job and, and uh, is meeting a, a baseline or, or better um, set of requirements. Our program has the Easter's Leadership Council, which is a multi-stakeholder group that advises us on how to guide the certification program. That group is comprised of recyclers like you, uh, your customers, so corporate and government uh, waste generators, also other nonprofits, uh, and, and they advise the, the whole program. Another unique element is our whole certification and accreditation program. Uh, I think you know that the ISO 14001, the global standard for environmental management systems, is uh, fully integrated into our standard. It is the framework on which, in which we put all the additional e-stewards requirement. If, if someone could mute their um, audio, I think it would help cut out background sounds for others. Um, additional, what that means is that because ISO is a requirement, we also require all of our auditors to have, to already be trained in ISO 14001. Uh, and then they, they have that as a baseline coming into our program. Then they have to be retrained in order to learn e-stewards and continually update that e-stewards training. In addition to that, we have some standards for the certification bodies which go above and beyond the global rules for CBs uh, because we want to make sure that we've got the authority to kick a, a certification body out of the program if they're really not meeting our requirements. So who's eligible to become certified? 
this is uh, an important piece that differentiates us as well. Obviously, recyclers and refurbishers, uh, refineries, uh, those who are actually processing e-waste are the ones who are eligible for certification because that means an auditor can walk in and see that you've got trained workers, you've got uh, workstations set up, you've got systems in place that are visible and uh, documented and that the auditors can truly audit. The folks who are not uh, actually processing e-waste and are not eligible for a program would include brokers who simply set up the transaction. Uh, the logistics companies, the truckers, or folks who are just, just collecting and not doing any real processing. A fairly recent change in policies for us, uh, or that's been better articulated anyway, is a requirement that if you own more than one facility, then, then your whole corporation, all of your facilities that are recycling e-waste have to become Easter and certified within one country. And the reason for that, if you look at that from a, your customer's perspective. We want your customers to be able to recognize your brand name and trust that any facility that has your brand name is going to be Easter and certified. We also give you 18 months uh, after your initial site certification in which to get all of your facilities certified. And that's regardless of brand and even if you have subsidiaries uh, who are also processing e-waste. So just to summarize here, um, we have a, now it's an 82-page standard with uh, a lot of clarity. The auditors love it because it's, it's very clear. You know it includes ISO 14001. It has an absolute ban on e-stewards, certified e-stewards, exporting the hazardous materials to developing countries for any reason. Um, that's not, does not include uh, attested working equipment going for reuse, by the way. Um, and this is consistent with existing international law, the Basel Convention, and the definitions found in the Basel Convention. Our standard also restricts uh, the toxic materials from being managed by prisons, prisoners, who tend to be disempowered as a group and also disallows most of the hazardous materials going to solid waste landfills or incinerators. And one of the other things that we feel very strongly about is protecting workers in the workplace. Um, we're quite concerned. We know of many very committed, very responsible recyclers who are trying their best to protect workers but aren't even aware of some of the hazards that are occurring. For example, the uh, chemicals in the plastics. And of course, we require tracking of the e-waste and a total materials balance accounting, which has to do with reconciling your incoming material with your outgoing material. So let's look at the standard itself. Uh, I think you know that there are currently two, two versions of the standard. Our original version was published back in July of 2009, and it's officially still in use. Uh, so we're in this transition period right now between version one of the standard and version two, which was published on November 1st of just this past year, this past fall. And this version two, uh, we're, right now we're training auditors to the new standard. And so in February and March, once they're all trained, you'll be able to get uh, choose version two as, uh, as the standard that you would like to be audited at. Both of these standards are available, including a free version um, at the eSteards.org website. Just so you know, the eSteward standard has been written by a multi-stakeholder process. Version 2 actually took us two and a half years of a multi-stakeholder process with extensive dialogue with primarily recyclers, but also a lot of uh, specialists or experts in, for example, battery recycling and data security recycling and those sorts of things. So um, we are the whole process, of course, is seeking a standard that uh, is really representing where the leaders would like to be so that their customers have their needs met. Um, I think you know already that when you get an Easter Rewards audit, you're actually being simultaneously certified to both ISO 14001 and Easter Rewards all in uh, one set of audits, which Mandy will tell you more about. Again, I've got just a couple of slides here about what is an EMS. What's an environmental management system? And this is a, the global standard that really has three core elements. One is to prevent pollution. 
Uh, another is to provide you with a system or a systematic way of ensuring that you're in compliance with laws and any other commitments that you make as a, as a company. Uh, for example, eStewards or R2 or uh, ISO 9001. And also that you have a commitment to continual improvement. So you may not be able to solve all your problems this year, but you're, you have a process for working and developing and continue improving your, your entire operations. So the purpose of an EMS really is to provide that kind of systematic framework for you to improve uh, and really lower your environmental risks. We have added into it uh, health and safety as well. This framework is really there to help you reduce your impacts and to understand your risks. You're, you're asked to really assess the risks. And it really creates a multifaceted system or process that ha you know, it's got many, many pieces that all have to be in place uh, throughout the year, 365 days a year, in order for you to really uh, know that you're operating according to, say, the Easterwood standard or ISO 14001. Uh, most of the time or all of the time. Um, and so it gives not only you assurance that you're meeting the requirements of the standard, but it also gives your customers assurance of that. This is sort of a visual uh, drawing of the five primary components. I'm going to go through this pretty quickly. <clears throat> but you have to start out with a written policy, and it has to have top management commitment to these things we've just been talking about, including prevention of injury and ill health. So the whole health and safety we've added into uh, the ISO 14001 set of requirements. And then once you have a commitment and a policy, you have to plan for it. What are our risks? We have to set your objectives and targets in order to try to uh, plan out how you would like to reduce your impacts. And then uh, you move into the implementation and operations phase where you, this is really not very nice, is it? Um, implementation operation is really all about saying, all right, we have our ob objectives and targets. What kind of resources do we need to put at this? How do we define roles? And most importantly, what are our operational controls? What systems do we set up in place so that we achieve this on a regular basis and train our folks? Um, and then a very <clears throat> another important aspect is the checking, uh, this fourth phase where you've, you've set uh, objectives and targets, you've set up your system to control your operations, and now you need to do regular checking. So you're going to do internal sort of self-evaluation. You're looking at your documentation, you're trying to identify where things are falling apart or breaking down. You're trying to prevent system failures, and so you're regularly uh, using this living environmental management system to uh, help you continually uh, determine that you are indeed meeting your objectives and goals. And the very last step in an EMS is that top management needs to see that you've done an in, at least an annual internal assessment and, uh, and, and recommit or change those objectives and plans so that as a business, you're continually evolving year after year. So let's move into the requirements of the eSteward standard itself. And as you know, this is both um, 14001 and also eStewards. There are many defined terms in the standard, as you can imagine. Um, I want to just talk about one of those defined terms today because uh, I'll be using it on, you know, as we talk a little bit more. This definition of hazardous e-waste is based on the Basel definition. As you know already, I'm sure, there are some elements or some parts of the e-waste stream that are not hazardous, but of course there are some that are hazardous. Based on the Basel Convention, the Easter's program has determined that anything that has a CRT, a circuit board, mercury, most batteries, uh, also the polychlorinated biphenyls and asbestos, uh, or anything that fails the toxic characteristics leaching procedure, uh, and if they're just uh, Sarah, Sarah I'm sorry. Sarah, this is yes. Guillermo. I'm going to have to interrupt you for a minute. Just a minute. All right. Uh, there seems to be an issue with our Spanish session. Let me just reconnect the audio, and then we'll, we'll continue. Just Very give good. me a I'll minute. You, okay, thank you.
Okay, and we are back online, Sarah, so we may continue. All right, thank you. So just briefly, this definition of hazardous e-waste in the Eastern standard is if the equipment that you have in your hands is, or you, you're responsible for, has toxic materials in it, and it's destined either for recycling or disposal, or perhaps it's even destined for repair or reuse, but it's not yet tested, or it hasn't yet been repaired, it's not fully functional, or if it's considered hazardous waste by the importing country, then it's considered hazardous e-waste under the Eastwood standard and, and has a whole set of restrictions on it. So that's an important uh, piece to get. The general requirements are you have to establish an environmental management system. It has to include health and safety and data security and social accountability. And by the way, I'm going to try to go through these fairly quickly so we have time for questions and also for Mandy to share some information with you. Um, that policy, the top management written policy, has to commit to preventing illegal exports of this hazardous e-waste all the way downstream of your facility uh, until it reaches final disposition, which is another defined term. It doesn't allow child labor, forced labor, or prison labors, uh, et cetera. The, the, there's a requirement at the bottom there, consistency with social accountability. Uh, that's a standard, a global standard. We don't require certification to it, but rather than uh, consistent with the principles of it. You already know that an EMS requires you to plan to identify what aspects of your operation may impact environment, data security, and health and safety. The E-Steward standard requires that you conduct a comprehensive risk assessment every three years, and it asks you to consider about seven different areas, including noise and ergonomics and chemical exposure and those sorts of things. And then you need to prioritize what you would consider the most significant aspects of your operation. So it allows you to take a look at the, the broad list of aspects and then choose which you believe are significant to, to start off uh, trying to improve. You have to identify applicable laws. Eastward, of course, requires you to, to know the laws in those countries uh, with whom you're trading. If indeed there's any international trade uh, anywhere downstream of you in those hazardous electronic um, waste items. Uh, you identify the objectives and targets. You define the roles and responsibilities. Uh, you have to report back to top management. Um, and make sure that there's continual implementation. And of course, uh, there needs to be ongoing training and awareness so that you have a very competent staff who can um, implement your, uh, your targets and goals. Communication is a very important piece. In this new version of the standard, we've really added a great deal in terms of communication with workers that they deserve to uh, to know about potential exposures. Uh, they deserve to participate in um, improving systems uh, to protect them. Um, and also, uh, we, pr we also require uh, a, a, a level of transparency regarding the hazardous e-waste, so a, a subset of all e-waste, that, that you, uh, if you become an e-stewards uh, recycler, that you need to be transparent with your customers. It can be proprietary, it can be you know, on a contractual basis, but you need to tell, to share with your customers where their hazardous materials, such as CRT devices, are ending up um, for final disposition. You need to document and control your documents. Um, so the whole operational control piece, uh, the health and safety is um, really a growing piece. Uh, we know that there are some emerging concerns, particularly about lead in this industry. And we're going to be putting together a, a group of recyclers. If any of you would like to participate in that, we would welcome your involvement once you're certified uh, to try to define what new requirements would become in the standard, uh, particularly around lead. Um, for reuse, I think I've mentioned that if any equipment, and I'm talking about components uh, like a circuit board as well as haul devices, any equipment that an e-steward wants to send into the reuse market, must be, by either you or your next tier end refurbisher, must be fully tested and determined to be fully functional prior to getting out of your control, either your facility or an immediate downstream end refurbisher. Um, 
and that is based again on the global definitions of, uh, of hazardous waste and what's considered a, a waste versus what's considered a product. So fully functional in the East Third Standard does not mean that you simply power it up, uh, which only tells you whether or not the power supply is working. You actually go through more uh, comprehensive testing to determine that uh, all the, the key functions are working. There, at the request of recyclers who helped us revise the standard, we now have a much more comprehensive data security section of the standard. Um, and so you'll find these sorts of things in the standard. Uh, this is intended to meet your customers' needs so that they can trust that if they hire a certified e-steward to manage their equipment, that there will be very comprehensive data security uh, requirements in place and, and audited. So we've seen all sorts of different solutions to the requirements, including very simple um, ways of locking up hard drives uh, so that they, they stay safe. Under the operational control section of the standard, uh, there are certain restrictions for the certified e-steward in terms of how they manage e-waste. Um, you're not allowed to shred mercury, for example, uh, unless you are you have the latest, uh, best available technologies um, with a you know negative air uh, shredding to and designed to handle mercury, <clears throat> and you have to have a whole downstream accountability system that that truly documents and controls where the hazardous e-waste ends up all the way through the recycling chain to final disposition. And you need to approve those facilities that uh, are managing your hazardous e-waste all the way to final disposition and have some objective evidence that, that the shipments actually uh, go there. I think you already know uh, we keep the hazardous materials out of solid waste and we don't allow them in from the developed countries to those with the emerging and developing economies. So really, if you think about it in a simple way, e-stewards are asked to know exactly where your hazardous e-waste ends up. You are allowed to export in certain circumstances, in many circumstances, but you have to control those according to the standard. One of the other phases, uh, requirements in the ISO 14001 standard is that you have to be prepared for emergencies and be able to respond. Uh, you have to have a certain level of insurance depending on what kind of operation you're running, what kind of risks you have on site. There has to be a site closure plan uh, with funding set aside to cover uh, should you abandon the facility or should there be a lot of e-waste left over that has to get managed. And then there's that whole checking phase of the standard, uh, which is really about monitoring and measuring the occupational risks, uh, monitoring the air if you happen to be breaking or cracking or shredding or heating this waste stream, and, and all the other things that, that come along with carefully checking how you're doing, tracking equipment. Uh, there is a requirement for you to report your annual volumes to uh, the eSteward's database. And of course, uh, as part of your EMS, your environmental management system, you have to make sure that you're in compliance with any laws that apply to you, to your, your business. Um, this, the second uh, bullet point there is taking actions for non-conformities. If you realize, oops, we're actually out of conformity with our own goals here, you, you have a system the, the ISO standard provides a corrective and preventative action system which you need to implement and really make this EMS a living system that helps you on an ongoing basis to uh, continually improve. Um, and of course you perform that internal audit uh, once a year to see how you're doing and of course you can do that more, more often if you want. And then finally the top management has to review the entire EMS at least once a year. One other important thing to understand if you're looking seriously into getting certified is that we have the standard that have, has all the requirements, but we, there's an additional document that you also have to use if you're getting certified, and that's called the sanctioned interpretation document. It exists on the eSteward's website, and that is a mechanism, it's a document, which allows us to alter or clarify, uh, change, the requirements and the standard in between formal revisions. In other words, say 
we didn't get it quite right and we're getting feedback from recyclers saying, hey, we need to have this changed or we need clarification about a certain topic, we can formally change the requirements for everybody by publishing them in a new sanction interpretation. Uh, and if you get certified, you would need to get certified to both the standard and whatever current sanction interpretation is available. I just wanted to now open this up to any questions that you have about um, the standard or about the program, how it came about, or, or what we're up to uh, before we turn this over to Mandy. This is Renee, and I just want to encourage our participants to, um, you know, please, please put any questions in the, the chat box or raise a hand um, and let us know if you have a question. Um, I had a question um, for Sarah, and I was wondering um, if I was a recycler new to any kind of certification process, where would be the best place sort of to start if I was interested in getting certified? Would it be development of an EMS or another place? This is what Mandy's going to be covering, uh, and, and so I would, would leave a lot of this answer to, to her. But in general, probably the best place to start is by uh, understanding what various programs have to offer, and particularly looking closely at the standard. So that would mean probably buying a copy of a standard that you're interested in, looking at it closely, and perhaps doing a gap analysis of where your current operation is at today, and what you would have to change in order to then become certified to this uh, new standard. So that's kind of a simplistic answer, but it's a good beginning point uh, to actually uh, take a look at the standard and then um, see how that, uh, how that meets your customers' needs, whether or not it would have value to them, and also what it would take for your own operation to transition to be in conformity with that standard. Great, thank you. Uh, we have two I also questions wanted from to get our, your thoughts. Um, oh, okay, great. We, we have two questions on our, from our Spanish audience. Uh, the first one is from Gustavo Nunez, and he's asking if there is any cost for the certification. Uh, Gustavo, yes, uh, there is a cost, um, and Mandy's going to be covering this, so I'll be very brief here. Uh, but there's a couple of costs. One is to buy the standard, which I think is currently $135. Uh, there's also the cost of just preparing your system, preparing your, your business to, to get audited. And that tends to be, a, um, it depends on how, you know, how far along your, your operation already is. But uh, that can be a significant cost. And then to pay for the actual audit, that is money that is strictly between you and your certification body. Uh, it's, it's, you hire the auditors, the independent certification body to come in and audit you uh, to a particular standard. So I think I'll leave it at that and let Mandy show you a slide that may do a better job of answering the question. Okay. Also, Sergio Medal is asking if this certification is, requ is a requirement from Semarnat in Mexico. I don't think so, but I'm wondering if maybe there's someone else on the call who could better answer that question. There are some people from Summer not on the call. I'm not sure they'd be able to answer the question. Can they easily open up their microphone by clicking on the image of the mic? Uh, we, have, we have a response from Ricardo Rios on the Spanish side. He says he's from Semarnat and it is not a requirement. Yeah, and there's, the, there's one more question from the Spanish audience. It says, uh, where, where, can, can be, where can be we be trained for these store certifications? Ah. Uh. Our organization has hired a professional training company called SAI Global uh, to develop and present trainings. And right now, we have only trainings available for the auditors themselves. We need a couple of more months, since we've just published a new standard, we need a couple more months to develop um, or re redevelop the trainings for recyclers, but we've got some fantastic trainings for recyclers. There's two of them. 
again, we just need to revise them uh, to reflect version two of the standard. But one of the trainings for recyclers is uh, implementation training. So if you don't know how to set up an environmental management system, this is the perfect training. I think it's a four-day training. It gives you, it teaches you where to start and how to work through setting up an EMS, and it sends you home with a whole set of tools that you can apply directly to your business. So that's one of the trainings for recyclers. The second training for recyclers is how to be an internal auditor. You know now that an EMS requires you to do your own self-audit once a year. So you, in other words, you need to have at least one trained person who knows how to do that internal audit. So this shorter training is teaching uh, employees how to do that internal audit to make sure that you're prepared to have the independent certification body, the independent auditors come in and assure that you're in conformity to the ESERT standard. So I, I'm not sure exactly when those other two trainings will be available, but hopefully by June uh, or July of this year uh, at the earliest. Thank you, Sarah. This is Renee. We have uh, several questions from the English audience. Um, one of the questions asks, um, is there a place where you can find out more information about specific risks from um, workers handling electronics um, or, or get information about where, if a CRT breaks, what would you do? That's a really good question. I don't know of a single um, source that's uh, got all of the information needed. I, I think we all know that this is a relatively new waste stream and so there's there's not uh, a good single source. There are multiple sources, however. Um, the Swedish EPA, for example, put out a, an excellent report listing the toxic materials in electronic waste, and so it's, a, it's an excellent source for figuring out what hazards are in what materials. Ideally, our manufacturers would be telling us, you know, ideally you, the recyclers, would be able to call the manufacturers like Dell or Panasonic and say, I just received a huge copier on my loading dock. Can you please tell me what's in it so I can protect my workers? But unfortunately, there's not that kind of uh, feedback loop. There's not that kind of information exchange happening. Um, we know that actually in our training, uh, we are putting together in our auditor training and, and for the recycler trainings, we are now putting have put together a, a handout that's about 114 pages long that essentially lists the toxins in various components and what the uh, occupational hazards are, what the environmental aspects are. And so that is something that uh, comes with the, the training uh, through our program. Um, so we have in, in the U.S., we have uh, increasing concerns with some of our government agencies trying to really do some testing and identify the problems in this industry. Um, but they're in the very early stages of running pilots. So I'm sure there are other resources out there, too, but unfortunately not a single source that I'm aware of. Um, and the next question asks about, um, and this may be more geared for Mandy's presentation, and, and you sort of um, hinted that if this had a previous question, um, what is the financial investment for a recycler to attain e-sort certification? Yeah, let me leave that to Mandy, if I may. I've already, I think, spoken to her a little bit, and I'd like to leave some time for her. To, and she's got a good slide. Sure. Um, the next question asks, how many facilities have the e Stewart certification outside the U.S.? Off the top of your head. <laughs> Mandy, can you open up your microphone and answer that off the cuff? Yes, so the, was the question how many in the U.S. only or totally? outside, outside the U.S.? Oh, outside the U.S., okay. Um, well, we have three certified recyclers in Mexico, and we have um, two in Canada with um, several in process to getting certified, and we also have a recycler in the United Kingdom. And we are seeing an increased global awareness with more recyclers um, gearing up and setting their sights on getting certified. So we see in 2014 that we're going to have a, a larger growth throughout the world. Yeah, and if I could just add, we're getting a lot of interest from uh, some South American countries and um, South Korea 
and uh, and the Arab Emirates and you know some of the Middle Eastern countries, we're seeing a lot of uh, sort of early interest where companies are are getting the standard and taking a look at, at what this would mean. So uh, it's definitely growing. Great, thank you. Um, the next question asks, how do you oversee CRT and BRF, or, I'm sorry, BFR management? Um, I think the question is sort of a responsibility um, question. Test, when you test equipment, which is exported, implies that the responsibility for the management of end of life passes to the importer, where sometimes there may not be um, an ESM end of life alternative. Um, and maybe this is speaking to the responsibilities of, you know, who should be testing this and um, what's, when you're getting something, what is, what is that implying? I'm really glad to hear that question because it, it helps understand sort of a core um, principle of the entire e-stewards program. Um, one of the um, phrases that you used was responsibility passes to the importer. What's really crucial to know in this in this program is that the way the standard, the e standard, is written is to place responsibility on the certified e-steward for the hazardous e-waste. So remember, we're talking about a subset of equipment, but it certainly covers CRT devices and the CRT glass. But replaces the responsibility on the e recycler for those hazardous materials all the way until there's either no more processing and the materials have been fully separated into separate, you know, lead or copper or steel or glass or they're going to disposal, or if it's equipment going for reuse, they've been tested and they're fully functional. So again, um, an e-steward would never be allowed to pass responsibility for the hazardous material onto um, an importing business um, without knowing that the trade is legal and that they're being managed in a uh, an approved facility and that it's not in violation of the Basel Convention. So this is a really uh, important piece and the Easter either has to do the testing themselves, they have to know what, what they're managing, what materials they're managing, or they can outsource that down uh, one tier. But the hazardous materials really need to stay in the control of the Easter. So in other words, their environmental management system has to set up control so that they're approving the facilities that are receiving their hazardous e-waste all the way down to final disposition. It's a very important concept in this program. We're really trying to daylight the whole recycling chain for the hazardous materials as defined internationally. That's the fundamental purpose of the program and ensure that it essentially stays in uh, de developed countries and doesn't, get, uh, doesn't end up in the developing world. Thank you. Um, we have several more questions, and um, I just wanted to um, maybe take a few more, and then we can get to Mandy's part of the presentation. Um, but this question's from our Spanish audience. Um, aside from environmental benefits, have there been other um, experiences or other um, users of the eStort certification who found other benefits by having the certification? Absolutely. Um, we've heard from a number, number of recyclers that it was very challenging to set up their environmental management system in conformity with the standard, and it took a lot of work, but that they were so grateful that they had done that, and it has absolutely improved their operation, and now they're very proud to open their doors to their customers, um, very confident that they're uh, meeting this global standard, and very confident about that they've essentially got the best practices out there. Um, and, and in addition to environmental uh, impacts, reducing environmental impacts, it also, our standard of course, very much focuses on the uh, health and safety of workers and the surrounding community, and it also very much focuses on the data security, which tends to be the number one concern of customers. Data privacy is usually at the top of their list. Uh, and then their liability for the hazardous materials tends to show up second. Uh, so we've heard from many, many companies that uh, they have found this to be just tremendously uh, valuable in terms of improving their own operations 
um, not just for environmental reasons, but occupational health and safety and, and data security and also social justice. And one last thing on this, and that is that they said an unexpected, many companies have told us this over the years, an unexpected value that they discovered was that their employees got started to feel like they weren't just coming to work to do a job, you know, day in and day out, but they were actually part of something that was more profound, you know, was having a bigger impact, and they were very passionate about this and very committed because they had become e-stewards. So I only know that because we've heard it from uh, a number of companies um, over the last few years. Uh, so this is Emily. I'm wondering, uh, if Renee, if we could also answer this one question before we move on. Um, this is uh, co uh, this question is uh, most electronic waste from big maquiladoras in Mexico is managed through intermediate waste management companies, not the final recycler. Does these two cover certification for these intermediate management systems? Uh, I'm not sure I uh, understand the scenario. I think I do. So let me see if I can answer this carefully. The any. Any company that is actually processing e-waste is free to choose to become e-steward certified. So whether they're an intermediary company or they're a sort of a downstream processor uh, who's receiving perhaps e-waste that's already been separated or dismantled, any of those companies would be free to become certified if they are the ones actually processing e-waste to one extent or another. And so I think the answer to the question is that yes, these intermediary companies would absolutely be able to become Easter certified. And in fact, there are benefits to using uh, either upstream or downstream e-stewards, other certified e-stewards, as your business partners because that means you will have less due diligence to perform um, because you know that that other facility is also getting audited and they are committing to meeting the same standard. So I believe the answer to that question is yes, if I understood the scenario correctly. Uh, do you want to take one more uh, question, Renee, or, or Sarah, do you want to move on to Mandy's? Well, Mandy, you have about 20 slides, and we want to save at least another 15 minutes for questions. Why don't we take one more and then uh, cut it off, and, and if folks will just hold their questions or go ahead and put them in the chat box, we can uh, tackle them at the very end. So, do you have one more question? Renee, do you want to field one more question? Sure. Uh, another one, another question that came up is CRT management um, and how difficult that can be even in the U.S. Um, can you maybe speak to maybe how are there potential options or is the market changing um, that would make it a little bit easier to recycle CRTs or use them differently? Can you speak to that, any? Yes, and I'm sorry I didn't answer that earlier. Uh, I think we all know that uh, CRTs are, the CRT glass is becoming a bigger and bigger problem as there's fewer and fewer options for using that CRT glass. So most of the furnaces around the world that were manufacturing new CRTs using the old CRT glass are now shut down uh, as we all move to flat screens. And so there is this very serious problem of leaded glass. It's not only leaded glass, but it's also much of it uh, has the phosphors, that white powder on the inside of the face plates that um, can easily contain cadmium and, and uh, as well as some rare earth metals. Um, this leaded glass is, of course, a hazardous waste in most nations and certainly under the Basel Convention in terms of international trade. Uh, e-stewards must control that CRT glass uh, all the way till final disposition. And so what does that mean? What does final disposition mean in terms of, of CRT glass? That means that either that CRT glass has been cleaned, so the phosphors have been removed and managed as hazardous waste in the country, and then the remaining glass, whether it's leaded or unleaded, goes to some acceptable usage, an alternative usage uh, that has to be approved. Um, and there are a number of there are a number of recyclers, including these stewards, who are now getting very creative and trying to uh, trying to develop 
processes and develop markets or find existing markets for glass uh, and they're sometimes using it to create ceramic tiles or glass tiles or put the glass into traffic paint, road paint, so that it shines, it glitters at night. Um, or the e-steward needs to send the glass to, unfortunately, hazardous waste uh, landfills. Um, I think what, what's happening up in, in the U.S. Uh, I think is also happening in other, other countries, and that is that CRT glass is just getting stored. Companies get paid to receive it, so they, they get all this money to, to receive the glass, and then they just sit on it. They just simply store it for a very long time, um, usually in violation of laws, local laws. And so because it costs them money to get rid of it, and there are fewer and fewer markets, What's happening is that there are some new technologies, uh, particularly coming out of Europe, um, that are not scaled up. They, are, they tend to be only handling small volumes right now, but uh, there are facilities being licensed in the U.S., and I, and I hope in Mexico that can um, put these technologies to use. Some of them are thermal processes where they heat up the leaded glass and separate the lead from the silica. Um, and there are some others as well. So hopefully there will be some more emerging technologies that will be uh, approved um, for use by e-stewards because we know we've got a, a very large CRT glass problem that needs to be dealt with for many years to come. All right. Well, I think we should uh, move uh, over to Mandy uh, at this point so that we've got time for some more questions at the end. Mandy, I would like to ask you to introduce yourself and um, take it away. Thank you, Sarah. And hello to everyone, and thank you all for participating today. Um, and as Sarah said, um, my name is Mandy Knutson, and I'm the Eastwards Business Manager for the program. And I've been with the program, involved with the program for over two years now, and um, I'm the main point of contact as far as working with recyclers who are interested in the program. Um, as you're going through the process of getting certified, if there's questions that I can help recyclers with, I provide as much support as possible. And then I also tap into our many years of expertise, whether it be Greg, our certification expert, or Sarah, our policy expert, and everyone at our organization. So if I can't answer the question, I get those questions answered. Um, I also provide support to recyclers when they're already in the program and some of the opportunities where we provide support and also um, have in, input from the recyclers I'll, I'll cover as I'm talking about involvement of the program and in benefits. Um, so with that, um, I'm going to go ahead and start um, talking about the benefits to the East Stewards recyclers because um, I know it's, a, it's a, a daunting task when you hear all of the requirements and, and what it involves but there's actually a lot of return on investment and rewards out the other side for the recyclers who are in the program. Um, some of the things that we provide um, from our e stewards program administration is we have an active promotion program that has a marketing program which helps to drive customers to the two e stewart recyclers. Um, this includes companies that are small and large, corporations, governments, and consumers as well. Um, since the program was initiated, going on its fourth year now, the brand recognition has just escalated. Um, a lot of that is due to the enterprise program, which is very unique to the Easter certification program. And that is where companies such, well, I'll get into some of the examples, but corporations, government agencies um, become enterprise, Easter enterprises, and they agree to work with Eastwood recyclers whenever possible. And we are very um, excited and eager to create more enterprise um, at Eastwood enterprises in, the Me in Mexico and um, in all of North America and keep growing that program internationally. And so we encourage our Eastwood recyclers to work with us and if they have customers that they would like us to help them bring into the program as their customers and can explain the benefits of being, for instance, an East Stewart enterprise that can help solidify customers for our recyclers as well as grow the, the program from both sides, the enterprise program as well as the East Stewart recycling program. Um, we also provide support through traditional media, um, social media, 
and um, other types of um, support as far as um, um, marketing collateral and, and that type of thing. Um, so next slide, please. So um, more customers are demanding that you start recycling um, certification by their recyclers, and a lot of this is because of the work that Roswell Action Network, the ban advocacy, um, increases awareness through the exposés that Sarah was talking about earlier. Um, some of the exposés have been done with um, like CBS and um, other, uh, other, other programs, and it's creating a demand at, the, at a global level, and it's making customers, your potential customers, realize how important it is for them to make sure that the recyclers they are using are doing the right thing and that they're willing to go through this certification third-party audit to show this in their entire downstream. So that gives your potential customers confidence that their data is secure, that, that the recycling e-waste will not end up in developing countries um, and harming the environment or, or, or humans. So um, we also increase um, what your customers are wanting by staying on top of international presence and at UN conferences and knowing what the international laws are, are changing as, because they are changing all the time. It's a very dynamic industry. So the, the Basel Action Network side is having this presence, staying on top of it so that we can keep our Easter recyclers informed so that they can proactively change as industry standards and laws and, and things shift and change. Because we always want to make sure our recyclers you know, are aware of, of these changes so that they can always remain compliant and ensure that to their customers. Um, and again, the enterprise program, this, this is a form of voting, of customers voting with their wallets. And we proactively sell this program to increase awareness for recyclers. And next slide, please. Um, we also have, Sarah had mentioned earlier, we have um, the support of over 70 environmental um, organizations such as Greenpeace, Sierra Club, and the National Resource Defense Council, just to name a few. Um, but from the beginning, they have been huge advocates and supporters of our program because they care about the environment and they have aligned with us and support our standard because we align with international laws and the Basel Convention. Um, next slide. Um, and also the enterprise program, we have 79 and growing companies. And some of them are international companies such as LG, Samsung, Alcoa. We have many large banks, um, like I mentioned, cities and states and governments. And we definitely want to keep growing that presence and would love to have more um, in Mexico. So next. And this is just another list of, of some of the, of the um, enterprises that are currently in our program. On the Easterwoods website, you can see the complete list um, and and how you know who's all involved with the program. Next. So I'm going to go ahead and, and start with this, just the steps to getting certified. And next. Um, so there's 10, oh, this is an overview. So there's 10 basic steps. And all of these steps can be found on our website. Um, so at any time after this um, webinar, if you have questions, you can always contact me or you can go to our website to get even more details. Um, Go ahead and go to the next slide. Uh, but the very first thing that would be important to do would be to, to either purchase the standard or at least look at the review version of the standard. Keep in mind, the review version does not include the full ISO 14001 language. Um, it's been paraphrased. And we have to do that because we do not own the license agreement for the ISO 14001. And our agreement with them is to um, charge a fee that we pass along to the ISO license holder. Um, so we do have the review version, though, that can give you a really good idea of what the standard is all about and what requirements are. Um, and that, like I said, is free on our website. Um, and the East Stewarts, one of the reasons that we include the ISO 14001 is because it is available worldwide. It's highly recognized worldwide, which makes it really a huge asset to the recyclers as well as um, to have a globally recognized environmental management system that includes ISO 14001. Next. So the next thing that you would want to do is to get quotes from accredited third-party certifying bodies. 
Um, we have currently three certifying bodies that are accredited uh, to do Easter certification audits, and they are listed on our website. And these audits, um, these quotes, you know, you'd want. I always recommend getting a quote from all three, and we are going to have another one added um, in the, the near future. So we will have four certifying bodies. Um, it, but it, it's a good idea to get quotes from all of them because they may have different auditors available that are, you know, there may be some that have more Spanish speaking, um, you may have more options, and you want to make sure you get the quotes from all of them to see if there's a difference in cost and which ones are going to work most with your business model. So the next thing you want to do is evaluate costs. I'm going to go into more details in that. Um, so, and then after that, you want to contract with the certifying body of choice once you've decided that you're ready to move forward. And when you contract, you are eligible to be listed on the eServices website to show that you are contracted in process of certification. Um, once you're on the website, there is a website standard um, policy that you need to, you know, reach certain stages of the certification process. Um, but once you're on the on, on the website, we make sure that you're you're set up so that you're going to be able to do that um, within a, a six to twelve month period. And I can talk more about that. But um, and there is also an initiation fee that you pay to the East Stewards program, and it's based on a sliding scale. And that way, it makes it affordable for all size recycling companies. Um, so the next slide will tell us about evaluating the cost in a little more detail. Um, as Sarah mentioned, we have um, two versions of the standard available at, at this time. However, we highly recommend if you're just starting the process that you would just work with version two because there is a timeline that I'll be talking about that this window of time that version one is only going to be available for. Um, and I, like I said, we do have a fee for these full standards. Um, and version two is $195. Um, there's the internal development costs, and this would be for setting up your um, environmental management system to make sure it's in conformance with the East Stewart standard, um, internal training of your employees. Um, some, some companies decide to hire a consultant, um, and there would be a costs involved with um, consultant fees, and that's a you know internal decision that companies make. Um, and also, like I mentioned, there is a one-time initiation fee, and we have an annual marketing licensing fee. Um, we have these based on a sliding scale, like I said, um, so that all companies, all sizes are able to afford this, and these costs are spread out from when you first decide to be part of the program, you know, when you're going through the certification, and then before we actually have the final and um, the final certification issued, that's when you would pay the annual licensing fee. So since that time period, you know, is spread out over time, that, that spreads those costs out for the recycler. Um, and then the other cost would be the on-site audit and certification costs paid to the certification body. And since this is a third-party um, certification, you would need to get those quotes from them. Um, but keep in mind, it is based on the size of the company, the number of employees. Um, and for instance, just an example, um, if you had less than five, five employees, you would be considered a smaller recycler since there would be less um, auditing days, it would cost less than if a company had 100 employees that would include, it would require more auditing days. Or if there's multiple locations, um, since all the locations in one country would need to get certified um, over a certain period of time, you know, that would increase the cost as well. But just as a, an absolute estimate only, because you'd have to get um, quotes from the certifying bodies, um, an estimate for less than five employees. Um, is about three to five thousand dollars for the process with the certifying bodies, and again, you know, you could talk about there you know, with them about how that that cost is spread out or what their payment agreements are. Um, but that just kind of gives you an idea of what the auditing cost could be. And as far as um, our our sliding scale for the initiation fee and our annual licensing fee, um, our our sliding scale is on our website. Um, but if a company, as an example, is revenues are under a million dollars a year, the, the annual licensing fee would be $500. The initiation fee would be half of that, which would be $250. All of our, all of our um, initiation fee and our annual fees have a cap. So there is a point where 
you know, this, this schedule, this fee schedule is arranged with a cap on it. Um, and it is based on the size of companies and the, the revenues, but it, there is a cap and it's actually a very, very, very small amount compared to the size um, of the company and what, what the payment, payment fee schedule is set on. So I'll go ahead with the next slide. So as Sarah mentioned, one of the really important things about preparation for the certification is to set up the environmental management system. Um, and that would require setting up your documentation, evaluating your, your current program model and business model and what you need to do to be conformant with the e-stewards and ISO 14001 requirements. Um, and all of that is, as you'll see in the next slide, um, so that you can prepare for your stage one audit. The stage one audit is where the auditor from the certification body that you contracted with will visit and determine if you're ready for your stage two audit. Um, they're both real audits, but the stage two is your full final audit that is making sure you've got all your nonconformities um, corrected and you're in compliant with the standard um, and your system is ready you know, to go to what they call their technical review. So when you're ready to schedule your audit, um, we recommend thinking ahead. Sometimes it can be a 30 to 60 day um, wait to get your auditor, you know, be able to have a, a date available to come to your, your facility. So as you see yourself getting ready and being prepared, just keep those, that timeline in mind. Um, but you want to make sure that all your policies and procedures are documented and implemented. Um, and that they're able to have something to audit. And that would include having three to six months of documentation. Um, that would be the ideal so they can see that you have your system in place and this is what you, you know, you've been monitoring, measuring, keeping track of according to um, what is required by the standard for your type of operation, whether you're doing full recycling or refurbishment um, and that type of thing. So once your internal audit is done, you would go you will, usually it's about 30 days, um, it can be longer, but usually there's 30 days to resolve any non-conformancies raised at stage one audit, and you'd want to make sure you schedule your stage two audit when you're ready for that. And that is, like I mentioned, a full on-site audit, which will demonstrate conformity with of all of the shell statements in the standard and the sanctioned interpretations. Um, the auditor will look at for evidence of conformance and non-conformancies, and point to what needs to be corrected prior to certification. And the final step is as, is as soon as you have your um, stage two audit complete, um, you would want to send the follow, you, we would want to execute the eSTORTS uh, marketing agreement at that time. And that's when we would invoice the recycler for the, the annual licensing fee. Um, I've seen recyclers get certified within two to three months, and sometimes it's taken recyclers, you know, up to a year to get certified. Um, once the first location, if there's multiple locations, is certified, um, all the other locations within the con com country must be certified within 18 months. Um, so that that has um, that's just something so that we we know that there's a process in place and that all all of the compliance is being met and certification at all locations for a recycler. Um, one thing I also have to mention is one other thing that has to be sent to um, the central, what's called the central database, is there a certain um, documentation that has to be recorded and maintained, um, number of employees, all of the requirements of the information that needs to be maintained is in the standard, um, but that needs to be sent to a central, a confidential secure central database um, before the stage two audit. Um, because the auditors will check to make sure that that has been, been done as well. So the next thing um, just to be aware of is the, um, what the eSorts membership includes. It's very unique um, to the certification program. Um, we have a lot of involvement with our eSort recyclers. Um, and just to see the structure, we do have eSorts board of directors. Um, there's an executive director. We have a strategic planning team and the Leadership Council, which Sarah mentioned earlier. The Leadership Council um, it is, it acts as an advisory board, and it is made up of um, recyclers. Five currently sit on this Leadership Council. 
representing different sizes of recyclers, different types of recycling businesses, um, and we listen to what the recyclers are facing out there in the world. We also have um, five seats for enterprises as well as five seats for other types of government or um, nonprofit organizations. That way we hear all perspectives and and take advice from them so that we can make sure that the, the eSTORT standard, while always remaining compliant with the Basel Convention and international law, also addresses the new and dynamic changes that are facing all of us in this electronic waste stream. Um, we also have a promotions committee, um, membership committee, technical committees, social media committees, and we host um, at least an annual face-to-face -face meeting um, with our recyclers so that we can um, get direct feedback and interaction with our recyclers. Go to the next slide. This is a picture of our last one, which we happen to have in Denver. We have it in different locations throughout um, the country just to make it you know, easy for different recyclers in different areas to, to attend. Um, so we were in Denver last year. Go ahead to the next slide. So I'm just going to cover um, some basics on um, behalf of Greg Schwann today. Um, again, he's our quality control expert who oversees the, the sort of certifying bodies, and he also will witness some of the audits occasionally, just making sure that you know everything is to the fullest compliance. Um, and right now, we are transitioning from version one to version two, and we are our transition plan is based on industry standards, but it's we're here to provide flexibility um, and and give the recyclers who are currently certified as well as those who are coming on board who may have, you know, gearing up to be version one and 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 already had everything in plan in place for that, you know, you can't just cut it off and say, well now everybody has to do version two. So we have this transition plan. Um, and if you can go ahead and go to the next slide. Um, by May first, twenty fourteen we will know after by that date we'll no longer be certifying recyclers to version one. So we really highly recommend any recyclers starting the process right now to go with version two right from the beginning because um, we're going to have auditors training starting in February and March and they're all getting geared up to be doing version two. And by after May 1st all certification audits must be done to version two. And by May 1st of 2015, all Easter certified recycling facilities must be certified to version 2. So at this stage of the game, it just makes sense for recyclers just to start with version 2. Um, and from the very beginning, it saves time and would save money and just get you on, on set where you need to be, because that's where we're going to be very soon. <laughs> um, so the transition time on, on the last slide um, really only applies to those who are um, already certified, but this is just to show that um, you know you can. It's it's going to give you time to get prepared for your audits, and get up to speed with the new changes in version two, and um, basically, I think that, is that my last slide? I think it might be my last slide. So, um, and one one of the things that we're very happy to do is support the recyclers as they're going through this process. Anything that we can help with answer questions and provide support with is what we do and why we're here. Oh, we have another timetable slide. <laughs> um, so this just shows, you know, just kind of put it in an easily tr easy chart. Um, audits to version one um, between now and January is the only thing available since the auditors didn't start training until February. And then both can be certified to, again, February through May 1st of 2014. But as of May 1st, 2014, and you know, no more version one. And so starting from this May, we'll start doing only version two. So that is covering everything I have as far as um, an overview. Um, if anyone has any other questions that I can answer, I'd be happy to. Or any questions about anything that Sarah spoke about. Um, any of the programs we offer or the support that we, you know, we, we supply as Easter administrators. And this is Sarah. If I could just add, if anyone has questions about the Easter Enterprise Program, which would be for your customers, we also have Mike Enberg on the line who could answer questions about the Enterprise Program. So what questions do you all have about anything related to Easter certification? Thanks, Sarah. <laughs> 
Um, this is Renee. There was a question um, from our Spanish audience about the audit, audit process. They wanted to know um, if um, they don't pass an audit, how much time would they have to be have available to correct um, any audit findings? Could you repeat the question? If they don't have an audit, how much time would they have to correct? No. It, yeah, if they didn't pass for whatever oh, reason or there was some feedback, it does the um, certification provide a specific time frame in which it has to be corrected or, um, you know, yeah. what is the timing with audit findings? Very good. So let's say you have your stage one audit, which uh, is a, really a chance for the auditor to determine that you're ready for stage two, that you've got all your systems in place, all your records in place. The auditor comes back and does your stage two audit, which might last for a few days, and at the end of that audit says, oops, you've got some nonconformities here and, and there. Typically, the certification body will give their client uh, 60 to 90 days to correct the nonconformity. And uh, although there is some flexibility there, and so they will be very explicit about where the operation is out of conformity. They will work with you to try to uh, make sure that you bring it into conformity, which you must do prior to the certification body. What happens next, actually, is that the auditors who've been working with you then go back to their certification body, their headquarters, and they say, we believe that all the nonconformities have been resolved or closed and that this company is indeed operating in conformity with the Eastern Standard and make a recommendation to their headquarters that that certification body uh, does certify the company. So generally 60 to 90 days uh, to try to resolve nonconformities, but there is some flexibility in there. Great, thank you. Um, another question from, from our Spanish audience. Um, if a company is processing multiple waste streams, um, can the certification, the certification process still apply to them, or would it just apply to the electronics portion of their process um, operations, or um, how would that work? The standard is only intended to apply to the electronic waste stream, and uh, you'll see in the title of the standard that it's for electronic waste. So it's not designed for, for other waste streams like auto shredding companies. It would not be appropriate necessarily for that. And, um, and so if a company, for example, has uh, a building over here that's doing e-waste and another building over there that's doing automobile shredding, it's only their e-waste operation that would be uh, eligible to become certified. And when they sign a licensing agreement with, uh, with BAN, it would only be that part of their operation uh, that would uh, fall under the, the licensing agreement. So I hope that answers the question. Great, thank you. Uh, another question from our Spanish audience. Um, can an environmental management system apply to other um, sectors besides, um, you know, people that process electronics? Um, the question was asking about the educational sector. Yes, absolutely. Uh, the ISO 14001 standard written by nations around the world was created in order to apply essentially to any sector. Uh, and therefore, it is fairly generic. In other words, it it has no minimum. It has no very. It has no uh, minimum performance requirements because it, it's written for all industries and including educational um, sectors. It it doesn't have any kind of minimum requirements. For example, it doesn't say you can't dump lead into rivers or you know soil. Uh, because it, it simply is a management system standard that says you have to plan, you have to set up your operation controls, you have to check and monitor, and then you have to uh, evaluate how you're doing and continually improve. So, yes, ISO 14001 is used uh, really in, in any sector, but um, that's why we have added many very specific uh, requirements for this industry where we've defined uh, the terms and we've restricted activities specifically for the electronic waste uh, stream because ISO 14001 does not do that. Um, so it's very generic, uh, but it's a good solid management system standard that's, uh, of course, widely used around the world. 
Thank you. Um, another question from our Spanish audience. If a company is already certified ISO 14000, would they have to redo that as part of um, the eSteward certification process? Would their ISO 14000 um, be re-audited? No. Um, we've set up this program so that if a company is already ISO 14001 certified, um, they need to negotiate with the certification body that they choose uh, in order for them to recognize their existing certification um, and hopefully reduce the cost for the audit because theoretically if one certification body recognizes and respects the work of another certification body, uh, they should not have to re-audit the ISO 14001. Now that's only good for a year. Um, the the e-stewards and the ISO 14001 audit cycles last for three years and so um, if a company has a current certification to 14001 it would automatically have to get a surveillance audit or a re-audit a year later uh, and in that case for the second cycle the second year, the Easter uh, certification body would be performing the full, the full surveillance audit at that point. But initially, um, you can expect, but you will need to negotiate with your certification body to uh, honor the the certification that you already have if it's current and if the CB, the certification body, is accredited. Uh, you should expect a, a discount on your your audit uh, costs. Great, thank you. Um, another uh, certification question. Can I, uh, the question uh, asks, can I apply directly for the version 2 certification or do I need to have version 1 first? You can absolutely should uh, aim for version 2 certification uh, and, and forget about version 1 which is uh, about to become obsolete. Um, I mean after May 1st of this year all audits need to be conducted against version 2 of the standard. But that said, just be aware that right now in February and March, the, our current Easter Eggs auditors are getting retrained to version 2 of the standard. And so right now, there are no auditors who are available at the moment for the next uh, month or so. Uh, and they're booked anyway. But by all means, uh, take a look at the version 2 of the standard and, and if you choose to become Easter Egg certified, um, set up your environmental management system to that and choose a certification body who is does have qualified auditors to audit to version 2 uh, because they're all required to only audit to version 2 after May 1st of this year. For companies that are already Easter Egg certified, they have until a year later, May 1st in 2015, to become certified to version 2, but that's just to allow a reasonable period of time for current Easter re recyclers to make the transition. Great, thanks. Um, I'm not sure I, I understand the next question, um, but I'll do my best. Okay. Um, maybe you can speak to the experience of e-stewards. Um, you know, the U.S.-Mexico border is very porous. Um, and if someone from Mexico wanted to import uh, materials from the U.S. to recycle and then re-export them back to the U.S., um, there's no requirement for Easter at certification. Um, that's my understanding. Um, maybe you can speak to the experience of moving materials between a border. Um. I can speak to this a little bit. I'm not clear, however, if this question is asked uh, within the context of being an Easter Egg certifica cer certified recycler or if it's just about the existing laws between the U.S. and Mexico. So I'll do my best or maybe answer it from both perspectives. Um, we know that there are no requirements in, in Mexico or from the uh, U.S. federal governments for, for companies to be uh, Easter Egg certified. So that's a a non-issue. If and, and we also know that there are there are agreements, uh, NAFTA and other international agreements uh, here in North America between our countries uh, that control um, cross-border trade. 
We also know that Mexico and the United States are both members of the Organization for Economic and Cooperative Development, the OECD, which is uh, a group of about 34 of the most developed countries in the world that have their own trade agreement for trade and hazardous waste, as well as other things. But So that OECD treaty, which both Mexico and U.S. have, have ratified, does indeed uh, control the, or it should control, <laughs> if it were fully enforced, it would control the transboundary movement, you know, the cross-border movement between the United States and Mexico, as well as NAFTA, uh, the North American Free Trade Agreement. Um, and, and so the, there's a lot of details there that I don't think we have time to get into, but essentially, Equipment or hazardous material can go from the United States into Mexico uh, and then could be exported back to the United States, but it would all have to occur within the context of those treaties and those agreements. Um, so there are restrictions. Typically, both governments, as in federal governments, both federal governments have to be involved and agencies, the competent authority in each, in each country has to approve the the cross-border movement of something that's considered hazardous waste uh, in order to be in compliance with these laws. So that's kind of it in a nutshell. And I hope I answered that question to your satisfaction. Well, it's a good shot. Thank you. Um, another question came in. Where can um, the version 2 um, certification be found for purchasing? That is on our eStewards.org website. So that would be www.e-stewards.org. Uh, e and on that website, uh, if you look at the, the bar across the top, there will be one, one option, which is eStewards certification which has a drop-down menu, and in that you'll be able to go directly to the Easter Egg standard. And as Mandy mentioned earlier, there's, there's two versions there. You can buy the full official version, which is what you have to get certified to, or you can download the free version, which paraphrases the ISO standard. Um, since we're not allowed to just give it away for free, we, have, have, we had to license the, the use of ISO. So both the free version and the full official version are available at eastroots.org. Great, thank you. Um, and one last question. Um, do you know of any European countries that require um, eastroots certification? No or maybe country. certification in general? Um, Europe, Europe is in a... Uh, has done a lot of work on this. First of all, let me say that Europe has ratified the Basel Convention and are, they're doing a really good job, relative to the United States at least, in controlling their exports of hazardous electronic waste. So within that legal framework, Europe has uh, also passed a law many of you probably know about called the WE Directive, which requires manufacturers to take back uh, their products free of charge and make it convenient for all of us consumers. And so they, because they were requiring the manufacturers to take back their products, they also moved forward with creating a, a, a standard, um, which was called WELABEX, WELABEX, uh, it's an acronym. Uh, and that standard, the WELABEX standard, is now being uh, shifted into a little bit more of a formal standard, which I think will be required uh, for uh, all of the 29 European countries to use for these programs run by the manufacturers. We've been in dialogue, the Easter's folks have been in dialogue with the Wheelabex folks for the last two years to consider uh, a mutual recognition program so that if, for example, someone is certified to the European standard, they would automatically be Easter's certified and vice versa. If someone were an Easter certified company, company, they would uh, be considered to be in conformance with the European standard. That is not yet in place. Uh, again, there are discussions. Um, we were needing them to have an accredited certification system like we do uh, to make sure that the auditing is very rigorous 
and, um, and that is going to be put in place in the near future. So we'll see how that dialogue goes. But Europe uh, has their own standard based on their, their very strong laws. Uh, and, uh, but we, nonetheless, we're seeing uh, some European countries uh, asking to become, or, or I should say recyclers in some European countries asking to become certified because their customers are asking for it. Um, Sarah and Mandy and uh, Renee, I want to just do a quick uh, time check. And I want to uh, check in with Guillermo to see if there's any other questions that are coming in from the Spanish um, audience, if there's anyone that is raising their hand that we'd like to maybe give an opportunity to get on the mic. Um, Guillermo, can you comment on that? We have about uh, maybe 12 minutes left. Yeah, we have one more question. I'll just read it out loud from the Spanish audience. It says, uh, where are the, t the three recycling, recycling certified plants located in Mexico? Mandy, are you prepared with that information, Mandy? Okay. Um, where are? Yes. Yes. Um, we you actually can find them on our eSource website under Find an eSource Recycler. Um, but one of them is let me bring it up so I don't say it wrong. <laughs> um, is in Nuevo Leon, Mexico. Um, there's then there's also Guadalajara and. Then we have some that are in process that are in um, closer to Mexico City. So that's where the locations are at this time. Guillermo and Rene and Emily, if we have a few minutes left, I would like to invite uh, my colleague Mike in about the enterprise program. Would that be possible? Uh, Guillermo? Yes, that is possible. Okay, do you want to take maybe uh, two or three minutes uh, to do that? And so Mike, if you could just introduce yourself and then, yeah, thank you. I've just unmuted myself. I hope it's working. Thank you, Sarah. Yep. Uh, we can hear you. This is good. That's a, that's a good first step. Uh, this is Mike here at eStores, and I'm responsible for the enterprise program that is getting companies and governments and institutions to uh, prefer to use eStores recyclers, building demand in the marketplace and educating the marketplace about why they should choose to use eStores recyclers, which ultimately means that there is more business for, for recyclers that certify to the eStores standard. And we are, as Mandy mentioned, we are we are keenly interested in adding companies based in Mexico to the enterprise program. Companies that would be able to say that they are responsible with their electronics disposition and choose to look for opportunities to use e-storage recyclers. That benefits the entire eStewards community by raising the level of visibility of the eStewards program among your potential customers. And uh, we think directly benefits eStewards recyclers in driving business to those recyclers. Um, we're growing the enterprise program. It need not be only Fortune 500 or large corporations that become enterprises. Any company of any size or any institution or any governmental body can become an e-stewards enterprise. And all of them working together help drive business to you, the recyclers. Uh, that's the quick brief on the enterprise program. And of course, I welcome any questions about how the program works. Enterprises do receive resources and marketing from us that publicly applaud their decision to choose to use eStewards recyclers. We also deliver to enterprises photos and videos and information that they can use to communicate to their customers or their shareholders that they have decided to be responsible with their electronics. So there are distinct, tangible rewards for companies choosing to be e-stewards enterprises. 
there is a cost to be an e-stewards enterprise. It uh, runs from 250 US dollars a year to $5,000 a year based on the size of the company. Please let me know if you have any questions and uh, I'll turn it back over to you, sir. Thanks. Uh, Emily? Uh, well, yes, I was going to say that uh, one of the questions uh, that uh, came from the Spanish audience is, besides the environmental benefits, which which would be the main incentive for recyclers to get certified? And I'm wondering, uh, Mike, if you could please talk about uh, some of the uh, larger businesses that have uh, taken it on themselves, given that there aren't uh, necessarily any uh, environmental regulations that require you to get certified. But what have been the motivation for these large businesses? And maybe you could comment on some examples of the large businesses uh, that have uh, taken it upon themselves uh, to choose to be uh, certified. And I'm wondering if you could, uh, one of the companies that was listed, for example, was Staples. And maybe you could walk us through what does it mean for them to be certified? Yes. So, so a, a clarification with the eStewards Enterprise Program, that is how we work with companies that are not processing electronic waste. It's not a certification. It is a agreement and a commitment by those companies to look for opportunities to use eStewards recyclers. So those companies like Staples or Boeing or Wells Fargo or, or um, uh, Bank of America don't go through the same certification as does a recycler, but they do make a formal commitment to, to look for opportunities to use e-storage recyclers. The reason why they make that commitment and the reason why they choose to use e-storage recyclers can vary from a company's overall commitment to being a good corporate citizen and doing the right thing with hazardous electronic waste to essentially risk mitigation, to lower their risk when they choose to use a responsible recycler. Many companies do so because they want to make sure that their assets are not irresponsibly managed, which can damage those companies' reputations and uh, their brand. Staples is a good example of a company that both chooses to use e-stewards recyclers because they have made, a, as part of their business plan, being as sustainable and responsible as possible, and they know by using a recycler that has been certified to the e-steward standard that they are using one of the best recyclers, objectively proven best recyclers in the world, and thereby they limit their risk of their electronics um, showing up in developing countries being um, uh, burned and, and um, uh, uh, taken apart in irresponsible and unhealthy conditions. We look for opportunities to work with companies in a variety of ways. And so um, enterprises or companies that choose to use these storage recyclers have a whole spectrum of reasons why they they sh they will use an e-steward recycler. The e-stewards program helps educate the marketplace on all of those reasons why a company should use a recycler that's been certified to the standard. Thank, Thank you. you uh, Guillermo, is there anyone else on your end that has a question? Uh, no, we don't have any more questions, Sunny. Okay. Um, Renee, do you think we got through all the questions?
Um, well, we have one more question, um, and it, it was, I think it's sort of a suggestion or maybe a thought. Um, would you recommend that border cities make a pledge to use certified recyclers? How about we let EPA answer that question? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, um, let me just say that um, as part of uh, this uh, overall um, uh, training, I'd like to refer people to EPA's website where we actually provide uh, some information on our desire to encourage, well, our, our encouragement in terms of businesses to get uh, certified. Um, just before we close, I'll, I'll provide uh, an email to that. Uh, Guillermo, I don't have that on the Spanish slide, so perhaps um, once I get to that point, you could just spell out uh, the EPA uh, website where individuals can get additional information with regard to uh, EPA's uh, website on e-waste. Um, basically, overall, I, I would I would applaud that. I would say that it's uh, EPA has encouraged uh, businesses uh, to uh, recycle their their uh, waste uh, in a in in accordance to best management practices. Uh, we have outlined um, the uh, overall best management practices. Um, uh, work and I'm not sure if there's anyone still from EPA headquarters. I know that earlier we had uh, Sheila Powell available on the line, but I'm not sure that uh, she's still on. But um, I would like to just say that yes, we would certainly applaud uh, having um, businesses on the border get certified. Renee, would you like to add anything on that? No, I think you, you said it all. I, I mean, this is, you know, we hope these webinars will further uh, inform um, border uh, recyclers in cities and, um, yeah, keep encouraging folks to um, either become um, certified recyclers or want to use certified recyclers. And I know that uh, many of the large businesses in the United States were also encouraged as part of you know, the United States uh, sort of general direction and policy in that area. So there's certainly a number of very large uh, businesses that are producers of electronic uh, components that have made commitments to work with certified uh, recyclers. I don't know, Mandy or Sarah or Mike, if you'd like to add anything more on that. This is Sarah. I would just simply add that if certified recyclers were indeed used along the border, it would go a long ways. I won't say guarantee because, you know, enforcement is always an issue, but it would go a very long ways towards um, ensuring that trade that got, does go across the border is done with full permission between the federal governments and that there is documentation uh, because the, the independent auditors would be coming and expecting to see uh, verifiable evidence of legal shipments. And so uh, 365 days a year, the auditor should be able to come in and say, I'd like to, to see a sample of your documents from January and June and December. And if, if the auditor is uncomfortable that, there, that there's a problem, they can ask to see further documentation. And then, of course, if there's a problem, they would say, we, we have a nonconformity here, and you know, you're not going to be eligible for certification unless you set up a system that, that actually uh, ensures legal trade. So it would uh, help out tremendously, I think, to, to make sure that what does go back and forth across our borders is, is indeed done in full visibility and permission with, uh, with both federal governments. Thank you. We've really come to uh, the end of our, our time, our scheduled time for this. Um, so I'd like to uh, thank um, Sarah Westerfield and Mandy uh, Knudsen um, and the East Stewart's uh, folks, um, Mike Enberg, for participating in our seminar. Um, I, Guillermo, if you could please post the last slide, which just shows the websites. Um, we will be posting a recording of this webinar on Beck's website, which is um, www.cocef.org, and we will also do the same in terms of providing a link to that on EPA's Border 2020 website. Uh, the address is www.epa.gov border2020, 
Uh, we will also have um, an opportunity to look at the uh, questions and see if we didn't uh, respond to all of them. But please, if you feel like some of your questions did not get answered, we'd encourage you to contact either Renee Bellow, uh, her email address is posted on this slide, or my uh, email address, uh, pimentel.emily at epa.gov. I have also have shown here EPA's website, uh, epa.gov slash epa waste slash conserves slash materials slash e-cycling slash certification where you'll find additional information on EPA's um, approach or information with regard to, to the certifications that are available. Uh, we would both, Renee and I, would like to thank you again for being part of this uh, webinar, uh, both our speakers and our participants. And we also want to thank the BEC and all our border partners and task force members for helping us put this on. This concludes our webinar, so thank you very much, everyone. Thank you, and goodbye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.